Well, good evening, my friends. My name is Margaret Trim. I am the coordinator of academic records and admissions at Vancouver School of Theology. Summer school is my favorite time of the year, and I'm so glad to be with you all. We are grateful to be on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam First Nation. May we always keep our hearts and minds and actions focused on reconciliation, justice, and peace. Tonight, we are so glad to have you with us, both here again at Epiphany Chapel and online via YouTube Live for our annual beloved Merton Lecture. For those in the building, washrooms are at the back, um, out the doors and around the corner or down the stairs. And we also provided a little bit of VST swag and information for you to take and to share with your friends. Tonight's reception and lecture has been co-sponsored by VST, the Thomas Merton Society, and the Center for Christian Engagement at St. Mark's College. I would now like to call Michael W. Higgins, who is an author, a scholar, Vatican Affairs Specialist for the Globe and Mail, Papal Commentator for the CTV Network, Educator, CBC Radio Documentarian, Columnist, Interim Principal, President and Vice Chancellor of St. Mark's and Corpus Christi College, President of the Thomas Merton Society, and my third floor work neighbor. We are glad to have Michael with us to introduce our 2022 Merton Lecture Speaker, Gary Hall. Michael. Good evening, everyone, and it is a pleasure to be here again. In the past, I've always been up here lecturing. Tonight, I have the tremendous advantage of being able to sit and listen to a lecture, and by a lecture given by Gary Hall. Some of you have already heard some preliminary comments ab uh, about Gary and about the relationship of the various bodies that make up uh, the relationship, the very creative relationship, that it exists among uh, the Thomas Merton Society of Canada, the Vancouver School of Theology, St. Mark's College, and now the newest member, the Center for Christian Engagement. Briefly, it was a marvelous story, a marvelous journey. I won't go over it all again, but it began in 1977, and here we are in 2022. Uh, that relationship has undergone various changes, permutations, and whatever over the years, but the end result is it has been a wonderful construction to allow for ways to explore, to understand uh, the meaning of Thomas Merton in our time. Not in a slavishly devoted way, not as an exercise in pious piffle, but rather to understand an explorer aching into holiness that speaks to us in our time and in our context. Gary's going to do that tonight as well in his own wonderful title about tensions, disruptions, and incompleteness, Merton on sustaining hope in the face of social crisis. The important thing um, in, to know about Gary, I think, is not just his academic credentials, which are impressive from the University of Cambridge and from the University of Birmingham, but the other things he does in addition to his uh, academic accomplishments. For instance, he has variously worked as a school teacher, an engineer, a farm laborer, and he has lived with the Tesse community. That's um, pretty good pedigree, I think. Um, and especially consonant with the kind of witness that we find in Merton, who was variously uh, a monk, a poet, a patrologist, a translator, a commentator on um, ecumenical and interfaith affairs, uh, a person completely committed to the exercise of ressourcement by going back to the ancient and original sources of the founders of Cistercianism and the Benedictine tradition. So many different things that he did. You know, he was also a lover and a novelist and um, uh, a man who liked to be both fitful and fretful and mystical. In other words, a person to modern tastes. What Gary is going to do in tonight's talk is to bring us into that web, into the heart of the mystique and the contradictions and the genius of Thomas Merton.
I've uh, had only a couple of occasions to work with Gary over the years. They both have been wonderful. One was uh, an invitation on one occasion, coming back from Ireland, to spend a little time at the Queen's Foundation and to give lectures and to speak to some. Uh, I did. I uh, actually, in a service, I did the homily, which in the Roman tradition would have me now permanently censured, but in the wonderful Methodist and welcoming tradition, it was accepted for what it was. Uh, not much, but something. And the opportunity of just simply meeting with the students and the staff. It's wonderful to see that this has been reciprocated now by the Vancouver School of Theology and the Thomas Merton Society of Canada, bringing him here, allowing him to participate in so many things. He'll be presiding as a preacher uh, at a service in North Vancouver. He has been giving a series of classes so here he is, the faculty person, and here he is tonight as well, giving a public lecture to us, friends of Merton, for a very long time. Gary Hall. Michael, thank you, and everyone, thank you for your welcome. I hoped John Cleese would kind of undermine any pedestals that Michael might accidentally put me on, but I can do that in many ways. Little fragments of memory were coming back. I was remembering lying in the snow outside the Ministry of Defence where I'd been brought down by a police officer with some blessed charcoal in my hand. It was Ash Wednesday, it was the first Gulf War. And that poignant moment of tension where it was both relief and uncertainty. Relief, I thought, this is a moment where I, I will take the consequences of being here. I expected to be arrested and all the rest that follows on. And having found a group of people, the Catholic workers we were with, including Daniel Berrigan a little earlier as part of our training, who had put us in a place which just felt right in a moment of tension. And this is what I want to explore tonight. Where do we put ourselves in times of tension? What choices do we have and how do we work with them. I was on the ground, I wasn't arrested because the policy at the time was that they would caution us, they didn't want to give us a day in court. That was essentially what was behind that. But the following year, that was 91, 92, I was in uh, New York and I was in Guatemala and Honduras and spending time with Catholic workers and others, learning the craft of working out where to put ourselves in times of war and crisis. I don't know what I learned. I remembered a lot of hilarity uh, one evening at um, Daniel Ber Berrigan's place up on Upper West Side. He invited us around for dinner and uh, regaled us with all kinds of uh, tales, not only from his days of um, the draft burning you probably know about, but the, the speeches he'd made to church folks and their reactions and so on. And the compromises he lived with, they had a little bar in their, um, their place on the Upper West Side when they first moved in. They'd had it taken out. They said he came in when um, he first arrived there. He was telling us he came in, he saw this bar. He said, if this, if this is holy poverty... I can't wait to see holy chastity. <laughs> but the thing I remember from his talk, he'd just flown back, I think, from um, Chicago. He'd been invited to do a talk. It hadn't gone down very well. I think he'd offended too many people by his, his biblical embodying of the prophetic tradition. And the reaction that he remembered from some of the folks there was Jesus would turn in his grave. 
He kept saying, he remembered someone just saying to him, Jesus would turn in his grave. And that said so much. Where do we put ourselves? Where do we put ourselves? And what's the point and what difference does it make? How do we abide with and inhabit the tensions of the present realities with which we live? Thomas Merton is a person and a body of literature. We might even say he's a historical person, he's a body of literature, and he's her persona which comes alive for us. Who comes alive for us? The historical person was always unknown to most of us. Others whose lives intersected with his have left their recollections and impressions this is the person who died suddenly on December the 10th, 1968, at a hostel on the outskirts of Bangkok, on the margins of a war, a war in Vietnam. God rest his soul. The persona lives on in the lives of readers who find themselves relating to him through his legacy, through his friends, and through our imaginations. This imagined Merton entered the world of hundreds of thousands of readers some 20 years previously with the Seven Story Mountain. An imagined Merton entered the world with the Seven Story Mountain. And through the opening lines of that uh, celebrated book, Merton tells us he was born under the sign of the water bearer on the last day of January 1915 in the shadows of some French mountains on the margins of another horrific war. It's a captivating opening. Thanks to Robert Giroux at the publisher, Harcourt Brace, who persuaded Merton to cut out the opening, the original opening, abstract, uh, dull, he called it, sermon, and just tell readers from the outside, who he was, where he came from, and how he got there. And it works. As a piece of literature, it works. But what pieces do we give each other when we first meet? I gave you some random fragments. What an odd way to introduce yourself. What an odd way to introduce oneself to strangers. Hi, I was born under the sign of the scorpion in the War Memorial Hospital beside the sea in a small Lancashire town, relatively untouched as far as I am aware by the social upheavals of the 1960s. You just wouldn't do it, would you? A strange way to begin, for sure. How do we present ourselves to one another? Which fragments do we include? To what extent do we dramatize or mythologize our own version of ourselves? I exist because of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. My father, the youngest of eight, was born in St. Anne's because his family evacuated Liverpool to escape the bombing raids. His father, who I never met because three of my grandparents died younger than my current age, his father regularly cycled 30 miles back to Liverpool for Firewatch. At least, that's what I was told. Had he not grown up in St Anne's, my father would never have met our mother. In the mythologised version, I would say they met rock and rolling at the Blackpool Tower Ballroom, though I can't be sure where that story actually began. What I do know is that it hadn't been for the repressive and regressive culture and laws of the 1960s British Christian context, my gay father would probably not have ended up with my mother at all. So, it wasn't just Hitler, it was criminalized homosexuality which brought me and my sisters into being. What do you make of that? 
How do we tell our stories? Which fragments do we include? How do they fit together? How accurate are our perceptions and recollections? Last month, I shared in conducting my sister's same-sex marriage in a church in Lancashire, and it was a beautiful day. First impressions of Merton captivated his audience and, in a sense, captured its author for the rest of his life. Despite the outpouring of self-expression which flowed from him ever since that time, that outpouring constitutes the body of work into which some of us dived or dipped a toe for who knows what reason and we found ourselves either cautiously stepping out into deeper waters or maybe caught by the current and swept off our feet by the coming together of so much which fascinated us. It's what Merton does, so much detail. This is progressing itself as far as I can see and I've no idea how to switch that. Ignore it if it's disturbing you. Technicians are busy so they're not going to help me. When we discovered the swathes of letters and personal journals, some of us were enticed even deeper. Intrigued by the mind of the author in the process of seeing and feeling and gathering and formulating ideas, the personal stories, the interactions and events out of which all those formal tidied up writings emerged, raw journals, letters, working notebooks, the reams of research that he was collecting as he became immersed in Catholic, monastic, contemplative traditions, the young convert absorbed in Trappist religious life and in the literature which carried the traces of monastic living which preceded him. He was immersing himself, collecting voraciously, wanting to learn, not just for writing and teaching, but for living wanting to shake off the toxic residue of immersion in a culture whose logical endpoint was horrific violence. That's what he was trying to do. Separate himself from the logical endpoint of dehumanizing violence. He wanted to see it more clearly. He wanted to see it clearly enough to resist and confront it in ways which might make a difference. He departed from one context into another, more fully and regularly exposed to the strangeness of a biblical world as it was performed by that Kentucky Trappist community. A way of living behind protective walls and rituals firm enough to withstand the destructive flow of dehumanizing warring world. So before the Seven Story Mountain dropped Merton's story into the midst of post-war Cold War America, his personal journals go strangely quiet. Hardly any letters exist. One of the reasons for so little output during that time is he was switched for input. Receptive, attentive, absorbing, between the everyday rigors and demands of novitiate life, he was absorbing so many literary traces of how the monastic contemplative life had been lived, always seemingly more interested in the living than in the abstract ideas. Go and have a look at the Valley of Wormwood and those books if uh, you want to check that out. But he was always interested in ideas which shaped or contained the living. Mapping the journey of learning to live, which was always about learning to love. Always about learning to love. Searching and mining and sifting anything deposited by the ancestors 
which may be useful for present day living. He presents the same kind of resource for our own sifting and mining for anything which may be useful for present day living. So he sifted the past for what might be useful in the present as he saw it and one way in which we might be faithful to his legacy is to do precisely that, not just with Merton but with everything else that we explore. What are the fragments left by ancestors which we can piece together with the fragments of our own life as we seek out ways to live well in our present situations? Merton happens to be a peculiarly rich source, a gateway into unfamiliar worlds, a meeting point of saints and hermits and mystics and prophets and poets and activists and neighbours and friends and all kinds of strangers, so many streams flowing through him. The body of literature has been, for many of us, a gateway into the legacy of the ancestors. The ancestors and the companions he was encountering and exploring. It's a gateway for us so we do our own exploring and sifting and gathering. The purpose is always to live our own present realities as best we can with a humility which recognises that ancestors and companions have plenty of clues and insights to offer. That's what he teaches us. Merton, the body of literature, is a treasure trove for readers curious about how life and art blend. All these fragments held together by a life lived, a life which was never accessible to us, but which just left these detailed traces that we find ourselves relating to, an imagined person reconstituted from all these fragments. And he did some of that reconstituting himself when creating essays or refining journals. He did some of it with his letters, with his dramas and his poetry. But we as readers are reconstituting him, conjuring him from the literature, encountering the Merton that we conjure as we read and imagine. Our capacity for relating and imagining is a remarkable thing. And I think Merton gives us a place to deepen and discover that capacity. So we might do it with one another. Or at least recognize that we're only getting little fragments of one another most of the time. And honoring the fact that there's a heck of a lot more that we will never see. Make space for it. The problem with Merton's debut was that the story, thanks to that judicious editing, was just too well written. Too well shaped. So complete. And that made it harder for readers and the author to treat it as just one more self-narrating episode amongst many. He got stuck with it. Rather than us recognizing it's just one fragment amongst the rest. The, the seven-story mountain became far too fixed, frozen. How easily could it be blended with the other fragments which would follow or those which had preceded? You know when ministers, student ministers, are the ones I experience, give their testimonies and you can kind of guess what's coming because there is a format which is recognisable and it's very diff difficult to veer away from that format and it's very difficult for each of us to tell the story in a different way as time goes on, as though our integrity might be called into question. 
And yet there are so many thousands of ways of telling our own stories. For readers who didn't first encounter Merton through the Seven Story Mountain, it's less of a problem. Those of us who didn't get to know him in real time, as it were, know Merton differently, especially if our early encounters were with the later Merton, which is normal. We meet the most recent version of a person, don't we? And then we might discover some of the backstory. The best books are still shaped, however, by that evolutionary progressive perspective. It is what it is, but that way of getting to know and of telling the story contrasts with the bitty, fragmented ways in which we get to know a living person. More likely beginning, as I say, with the latest. Present day readers encounter Merton for the first time anywhere. The whole lot is out there now, more or less. You can start where you like and piece together the fragments in whatever way we choose. But it's helpful to remember for those of us who are encountering Merton more recently, the impact, the impact of that debut, that first self-telling, not just in relation to Merton, but in relation to life. Was it too complete? How hard was it to break open? Where were the cracks where the light gets in? Did you ever play with kaleidoscopes? Yeah. Someone in our family had a kaleidoscope and it fell in such a beautiful pattern they wanted to keep it there. And it sits on a shelf. And no one's allowed to use that kaleidoscope anymore in case they disrupt the pattern that it fell into. Okay, the words which were passing around randomly. I'm sure I can switch these to a more automated mode, but I'm not going to step away. But let's, let's think of language, integration. Think how they feel to you. Final integration, integrated humanity, completeness, wholeness, a whole person. Inclusion, inclusive, how do they feel? Probably good. Kind of vocabulary can cheer us, it can guide us. It's there in Merton in some of his sources, in ways that he and his work have been described is quite common. And the words are used to speak of things we think good, they are assumed positive. But some of the ideas, some of the assumptions behind that kind of vocabulary are being questioned. What in fact is being imagined when we speak of integration or inclusion? Who's included? Who decides who is included? What's the thing that you're imagining that people are being included in? In the worlds of education, and social work and theology, the language is being questioned. Who is being included in what and who decides? Or when we talk of a whole person, this is, this is troubling. Are we in fact meaning everything that we are, everything that the person is? Or do we have some kind of process in mind Becoming a whole person? What are you now? What does a non-whole person look like? And yet we use it so glibly, so easily, as though it has meaning that we all understand. You are already always a whole person. Get used to it. This is your reality. Or when we talk of, well, 
what shall we say, the world as it should be. You and I can grow, change, learn, get well, we can get free, but to speak of this as becoming whole implies a kind of repair or a movement towards closure, completeness. And what's completeness? Completeness is no room for anything else. An end point. That's it. We're done. We're whole now. Well, of course, there are occasions for repair and closure and progress and growth and specific occasions, particular circumstances. The vocabulary has a limited use. But when it's generalized, and this is my point, when it's generalized and assumed a kind of universal good, we might want to pause and take stock. There are romantic versions, are there? You complete me. There was a piece missing, and you're it. That's it now. No need for more pieces. I'm done. Thinking beyond the individual, we might speak of integrated humanity. Some have spoken of this around me, and there was a great collection early on with precisely this title. And we have impressions of what that kind of wholeness might mean. It's a peaceful kind of image. But is it always helpful? If I carry an ideal aspiration for integrated humanity, do I have to look away from the ever-present conflicts and clashes and frictions which are part of life and always will be? What do I do with those? Does integration include the frictions? Are tensions included? Or must they be somehow released and dissipated? Wholeness, completeness, integration, inclusion, ways of speaking about good things, good aspirations, good commitments. But this kind of vocabulary is not enough. That's all I want to say. It's not enough and it's not always appropriate. Incompleteness, flux, tension, fragments. How do those feel? Vocabulary with no end point, no resolution, no closure, endless inscription, endless inscription. Merton finished the geography of Le Grair. It was published after he died. It's a tale of endless inscription kind of language may not resonate in the same way or it may be heard as problematic. What are our first responses, our instincts to flux, incompleteness, fragments? Do we need to resolve everything? Is that the instinct? Do we need to know the end point? What happens when we reach an end point and life is not quite as satisfying or fulfilled or resolved as we hoped? I remember speaking to ex-ANC members after they won in South Africa. And how disappointed this particular woman I know was some years later, having given everything to cost a lot, including her son's life. And they won. And this was several years later and she's saying, what is that for? What was that for? And I'm not sure what to do with that testimony, except hear it. But what is it when we win and life isn't as resolved as we dreamed it would be? What do you do next when you've won? If we're not expecting everything to be resolved forever, perhaps we can sustain more complex living. From a reader's viewpoint, Merton entered public life as a complete story, and then he became fragmented. It was that way round. In terms of the story, the way Merton became known was as that movement from completion, Seven Story Mountain, 
to fragmentation, all the bits that followed on, and they're still coming. Seven Story Mountain appeared as a story moving through stages towards a resolution. The model is there in the story itself. It proved difficult to crack that story open, to reorder the pieces, and to add new pieces. If we don't question it, I wonder what we're doing to ourselves and our own stories, and what that's doing to us. Let's pick up some Merton writing. The sixth of the seven volumes of the journals of Thomas Merton covers the period from January 66 to October 67. It's edited by Christine Boshan. It was given the title, Learning to Love. These journals are sometimes called private, though I prefer Victor Kramer's description of raw journals. Uh, Merton knew they would be read. They weren't that private. Kramer also questioned the imposition of titles when they were published because they pre-interpret what you think you're reading. They imply a progression towards a goal, towards completion. Look at the series of titles of those journals. This journal, the sixth of the seven, mentions a 25-year embargo on publication. So we saw the first edition in 1994, I think it was, 26 years after Merton's death. And in it, he refers to the Merton Room being set up at Bellarmine College in Louisville. All the busyness, he says, of filing and cataloguing every little slip of paper I ever wrote on. What a comedy. But I like it, he goes on, and I cooperate wholeheartedly because I imagine it is for real, that I will last, that I will be a person studied and commented on. This is a problem, he says. And he spoke of the center as a place where his papers live, where his papers are more real than he is, a place in which a paper self builds its nest to be visited by strangers in a strange land of unreal intimacy. That's the mood he was in at the time. 14 months after the last entry of this volume, Merton would be dead, electrocuted, having just addressed a conference of religious on the theme of Marxism and monastic perspectives, again on the fringe of a war, on the margins of a war. Just look at that picture there. Speaking about what Marxism and monasticism have in common, while his compatriots were flying planes out of the same country to bomb their neighbors, the communists. This is Merton's method. The war in Vietnam was escalating. He writes of this fantastic, tragic, absurd war going on. More and more I'm convinced that the real problem is the delusory character of American thinking about life, reality, what the world is all about. Men with incredible technical skill and no sense of human realities. Uh, speaking of Americans as an American, of course. Um, then on March 23rd, 1966, Merton left the Hermitage to go to hospital for back surgery. A week later, he met a young woman known as M, a student nurse assigned to care for him, and they fell in love. A substantial part of this journal is preoccupied with this brief and intense affair, sometimes moving, sometimes profound, sometimes silly. This was a love which met him at a time when he was ready and he was vulnerable physically vulnerable, emotionally fragile, cast adrift from his community as a hermit in the woods. According to Merton, this was a love to which he almost surrendered. 
which brought him intense joy and confusion, which scared and thrilled him, which caused him to question repeatedly the meaning of his vocation as solitary, as monk, and as writer. He imagined the possible lives, the possible life he hadn't had. Something is building up to break the dam, he then wrote on Advent Sunday, 1966. Something is building up to break the dam. The nurse was young. There's plenty to indicate something of a midlife crisis going on. But that would just be to impose a pre-interpretation onto the detail that he gives us. I don't know. I only know what he tells us, and she's chosen to tell us nothing. But we can piece together the fragments in more than one way. When we read more attentively, we find something other than pheromones attracting Merton. It's difficult to miss in this journal. His repeated comments on noticing and delighting in children, especially girls, He's charmed by them. Does that raise alarm bells for you? Or are you just curious? I see no reason for alarm. But we're reading it through our present day sensitivities, aren't we? I've heard no one suggest there's any cause for alarm. But the child is everywhere in Merton's writing. Usually the child is wisdom, proverb, Christ. The prophet who says what she sees when everyone else colludes with the madness of a naked emperor. The child is there throughout. And I mention Merton's delight in children through this journal because he sometimes uses a similar language in his description of his attraction to the nurse. He doesn't make explicit connections between those observations, but he does occasionally use the same descriptive language. Aside from her womanly sexual charms, there's evidently something else which draws him in. For instance, he writes, there was in her a wonderful, sweet, little girl quality of simplicity and openness, and I suppose this is closest to being her true self. It is with this self that she told me I will love you always. How do we hold together these fragments? What do we make of them? What story do we turn them into? Regular hints that a childlike presence, profoundly alive and liberating throughout Merton's writing, perhaps Sophia, perhaps Mary, even the Christ child, speaking to him time and again through other people, through dreams, through experiences, the summer of 66 was a vital episode in Merton's life, but there were very many other episodes no less vital. How do we hold the fragments together and inform our own living in chaotic times? How do they inform us about Merton? Which episodes take precedence or leave the deepest impressions? Other episodes from the 1966-67 journal include Merton being indirectly invited by the Pope to write a letter to the world on behalf of contemplatives. It seems to take a while for him to realize that he is the one actually being invited to do it. And his response is wrapped up in this sense of unreality and irony. He knows what's going on in the background how could he be seen as any kind of representative whilst living what he called a sort of patched up crazy existence, a series of rather hopeless improvisations, a life of unreality in many ways, always underlain by a certain solid silence and presence. September 10th, 1966, Merton makes a commitment in writing to live in solitude for the rest of his life. How hard would that have been? Shortly afterwards, he made another illicit phone call to M. But in the end, 
it was the solitude he chose. Describing that solitude and its meaning in so many ways. And one of the ways he described it was as preparing for death. He was struggling, but that was nothing new. In Merton's heart, soul and mind were endless struggles. We might even say that one of the peculiar attractions which draw some of us into the world of Merton are these struggles. We see how with a kind of embodied seriousness, he struggles to live radically, not just the Christian way, but a deeply human way, a prophetic life of contradiction in the face of a desolate and self-destructive culture. Do the struggles and tensions attract us? Trappist discipline and the trust of his fellow monks, his church, his readers, a young nurse of Vietnam War, poets in Latin America, civil rights, too many visitors, a flow of letters mingling with the literature of Albert Camus, William Faulkner, Rilke, so many others. Merton, the reader, away from the restraining and sustaining rhythms of shared monastic hours, the trees which say nothing and the rain which comforts him, the creatures in the fields and in the heavens, a new geography. and him pressing all the time for authenticity, knowing these journals will be read. They reflect only moments, fragments of a much greater picture. He doesn't give us anything, everything, by any means. He's very selective, just a bit of writing, and it's weeks before the next entry. But they build, they give us impressions and then he entrusts them to unknown readers like us who will take them and reconstitute him as a narrative which must never be closed because it's never complete. There's always another way of telling this story. After the intensity of a new love, he writes, this is important, this went to the abbot. My fall into inconsistency was nothing but the revelation of what I am. The fact that in community this could comfortably be hidden is to me the most valid argument why I should never under any circumstances get myself back into the comfort of pseudo wholeness. I am now in several disedifying pieces. That and not loneliness is the trouble. I am divided by having seen the despairing hope of wholeness with a partner of the other sex, which is, of course, totally out of the question, and a wholeness alone, which I do not have. And so he goes on. Since the journals were published with their smart covers and their sequential titles and so on, there's a risk we confuse them with Merton's carefully crafted books they're more like a manure heap, if you like, where you dump all the stuff that may be useful for growing other things. However aware he was that these writings would also be read, we need to leave them open, always fragmented, to blend with our own fragmented ways of telling our stories. Like a paper trail along the way, he drops this litter, he plays with thoughts and then he moves on. Like weaving baskets and burning them as he described it, just like the old monks did. 
I love those books. I need to remember what they are. The point is, let's see them as fragmentary, along with all the rest. And let that raise a question for us about how willing we are to sit with fragments. How willing are we to sit in the pause before we turn it into a narrative? Where do we deepen the capacity for sitting with the bits without tying them together into a story? Because that might be the moment when new possibilities come through to us. Fragments we thought invaluable suddenly fit and help create a different kind of picture. Merton on Advent Sunday. Let's end here. December 2nd, 1966. The word of God is a flood which breaks the dam. This from a Babylonian source, but in the spirit of the Old Testament and Marxism for that matter, he says. But basic. One senses this in our community to some extent, uneasiness, anguish, disease, because something is building up to break the dam and the word is inscrutably different from the comforting platitudes of the superiors. But this sense pervades all society. It's resisted by those who erect their word into a dam and are determined to hold it at any price. In seasons of celebration, the Advent section, Merton writes this. So we may at times be able to show the world Christ In moments when all can clearly discern in history some confirmation of the Christian message, but the fact remains that our task is to seek and find Christ in our world as it is, not as it might be. Our task is to seek and find Christ in our world as it is and not as it might be. The fact that the world is other than it might be does not alter the truth that Christ is present in it and that his plan has been neither frustrated nor changed. Indeed, all will be done according to God's will. Our Advent is the celebration of this hope. The flood which breaks the dam. A breaking dam sounds unwelcome, even disastrous dams are constructed for many reasons, sometimes to protect, more often now perhaps to generate electricity. Villages get flooded, but we depend on electricity, yet some dams need to be broken. In Merton's biblical image, the dam is an edifice which needs to be cracked open just needs to be cracked open despite the threat of flooding behind the dam something is building up he says it's a word quite different from the comforting platitudes of the institution something is building up that was then what about now do we hold the tension do we keep repairing the dam or do we let it break and see what happens? And does Merton in his monastic strangeness, alterity, hold the tension for us? That's the question I want to leave us with and hope that it's generated a few reflections 
that we can ponder together. Thank you. Thank you for being here, by the way. It's nice to see you. <laughs> I don't know I can answer that question. I know he was massively criticized for doing it, especially in the earlier days, those first publications. Um, some of his fellow Catholics um, and theologians slammed him as a Trappist, exposing so much of his personality. Um, I'm remembering a conference I did uh, not so long ago with Ashley Coxworth, a Bart scholar, because Merton and Karl Bart died on the same day. And the contrast is stark. I mean, Bart peacefully, old man, Merton suddenly electrocuted. Merton wrote on Bart, Bart had no time for Merton. And Ashley Coxworth, um, fine Bart scholar, good friend, uh, concluded that Bart needed Merton more than Merton needed Bart. And it was about simply acknowledging how much of the biography all, always defines our theological thinking and writing. Um, simple as that. Um, I think Merton had impulses. I think him losing the mother that mattered so much to him, and then his father, and then his young brother, he, he confesses sometimes, he's, he's kind of reaching out for contact, human contact through his writing. You get that sense of need coming through. But um, when he was attempting to write a more systematic work, 1949, it? and it, it nearly did him in, I think he... Um, resolved always to write more existential theology. Um, his concern was with how doctrine resonated in a human life. So he wasn't a professional organizing theologian. Those people mattered to him because they resourced his reflecting on how doctrine resonated in a human life. And that was his bit of the equation, I think. 
but why he needed to do it. Others may have answers to that. Michael, help us out. Judith. He might have asked the question the other way around. I mean, why are people not doing that? <laughs> why is Tillich not telling us a bit more about himself? You know, um, Augustine was a massive influence as, as well as Dante, he mentioned. So he was kind of following on those traditions. Um, rewriting confessions and divine comedies. Hi. Hi. Um, I, uh, I'm with the United Church of Canada, and we have a magazine. And in a recent edition, there was an article on Henry Nouwen, in which for the first time I was made aware that he might have been struggling with his sexuality, which influenced his writing. And uh, the particular article was about, um, well, the, he was being held by this group of young people who were um, gymnasts and and I just I was struck in anyway hearing uh, again tonight uh, the comment about Merton's um, open and struggling with that part of being human I guess I'm just making the that both Henry Nowen and Merton maybe had a similar struggle um, we have a biographer of Henry Nowen in our midst he, he can tell us more of that. <laughs> uh, I, I know there's people listening online. Yeah. The relationship of Thomas Merton and Henry Nouwen is both complex and simple. It's simple in the sense that uh, they met very briefly. Um, it had a compelling effect on uh, Merton. Uh, I'm sorry, on now, and it had absolutely no effect on Merton, and in fact, he misspelled his name in the diary of that day. Now, there are reasons for that. I think um, Thomas Merton was uh, just uh, about a year shy of his uh, accidental electrocution that is still, by the way, the generally <laughs> conventional and most plausible manner of his death, though there are countless other suggestions. Um, Henry Nouwen was just beginning his career. He had come to the United States and had um, been in, um, at an uh, institute for, in Topeka, um, the um, Menninger Clinic, on psychi psychiatric research and religion. And he had uh, been invited to come to, by the dean of theology, no, I'm sorry, the uh, chair of the Department of Psychology to come to Notre Dame to, to teach, which he did, briefly. Um, then he was invited by the uh, Dean of Theology at um, uh, Yale University to come to Yale, where he went and he remained 10 years. During that period of time, he continued to absorb what he understood Merton to be. He wrote a book on Merton called Thomas Merton Critic, not a particularly good book, but it is a, an early work. Um, but that, that stands in sharp contrast to what happened throughout the 1970s, right into 1980, when he took two particular extended sabbaticals in a Trappist monastery in the north of uh, New York State. And during that period, maintained strikingly powerful diaries, in many ways modeled on the diaries or journals of Thomas Merton. So Merton entered into his bloodstream as a diarist. Um, uh, John Uts Bamberger has a famous line, he's a psychiatrist, was, he's deceased, um, and was in many ways closely aligned with Merton because he was Merton's um, scholastic at Gethsemane. And he said, Merton uh, existed, felt he lived in his skin. And as a consequence, he was of, of enormous interest to psychiatrists. Merton had many psychiatrist friends, many ranging from Eric Fromm to um, 
the famous uh, uh, Canadian Jewish Catholic convert uh, Carl, just the last name's gone out of my head right now, out of Montreal, and then several other psychiatrists of lesser distinction um, who were fascinated by Merton and the complexity of Merton's life and all this kind of thing. But anyway, Nowen was drawn to that, but he was drawn primarily to his capacity for self-disclosure, which Nowen was especially attuned to. I think, it's only my opinion, but I think the diaries are Henry Nowen's finest literary achievement. They are far better than his short theological homiletic books, many of which exist, and many of which are worked uh, used in parishes, particularly Protestant parishes, to great profit. But I think if you want to look at Nowen as a craftsman, you go to the diaries, five diaries, and those diaries are an attempt to very seriously emulate the man who became his spiritual, and I would say, to some degree, literary mentor. Merton dies in 1968. Nowen dies in 1994, I think. It's 1994 or 1996. Uh, maybe it's 96. But quite a number of years later, all right, uh, they will go off on very different trajectories, but there are ways in which they are aligned. And they are both deeply, unapologetically, autobiographical writers. Merton is a little more successful, I think, uh, partly because he's a little more playful and partly because he's a little more inventive. He writes a novel, which Nowen does not do. He writes a play, which Nowen does not do. He writes 10 volumes of poetry of various levels of distinction and success, which Nowen never does. So Merton, Merton enters into a multi-variegated autobiographical um, um, modality. With, with Nowen, it is more specifically the diaries, but then it would evolve into or be complemented by an equally um, effective gift. And I think, though Mertonians would be appalled by this, Nowen was actually a better letter writer than Merton. Because in, Mert, in Nowen's letters, he, he speaks through the heart. Uh, Merton speaks about his travails. He speaks about cerebral issues. He speaks about the topic at hand. He speaks about a particular issue that would be raised by a correspondent and responds in detail. He's, he speaks about information that he's need. So he's out there trolling, uh, sh uh, you know, uh, fishing, getting material. Nowen treats his letters as modes of confession. It is his way of being the universal pastor. So when the letter comes, the letter isn't about him. The letter is about the individual who has written and what they need and how he can respond to that letter in as minimal and as effective way as possible. So the letter is not seen as an extension of his autobiographical ever-creating self, which in Merton's case was always true. His letters was, were always an extension of the uh, other modes of autobiography that characterized his writing. I'll just conclude by saying the Seven Story Mountain was an unanticipated success. Nobody thought it would be successful. His abbot asked him to write him because his abbot thought quite astutely that he would go mad if he couldn't write. His subsequent abbot was a little... <laughs> a little more entrepreneurial, he realized that now Merton could write, so he had to keep writing because this was going to be constant revenue for the monastery. But for the abbot who commanded him to write it, Merton, um, Merton was a, um, uh, his, his experiment um, surprised, and you mentioned him, um, Gary, uh, Robert Giroux. Giroux was his um, agent. He went to the head of the publishing firm that would publish it, and the publisher said, um, ask Giroux, would this be successful? And he said, we'll be lucky if it breaks even. They sold 600,000 copies in the first year. It continues to be in print. It's been published in countless languages. It responded, admittedly, to a period in time, but if that was only the case, why is it still read? so many decades after its publication in 1948. But that's how Merton began. He had some earlier work, hagiographers, which he resented, um, uh, some poetry, which was actually quite good, but uh, primitive, early poetry, and then The Seven Story Mountain, 
which he assumed with some reluctance and which we now know, or have known for a while, was severely redacted. Okay, severely redacted. So we, and in, the, in England, they, um, um, they uh, did not have um, the, the full Seven Story Mountain to 1975. Up until then, they had the Evelyn Waugh edited elected silence. And Waugh was a sharp critic of Burton's, by the way. Anyway, I have been blabbering away, and I, I, the question wasn't asked to me. I got drawn into that, Gary. You sent me into that. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Angus. Angus is a big part of my discovery and working with Merton. Do I need to use the mic for people online? Yeah, there's people online using it. Thank you. Um, all I want to say really Gary, was to thank you for sharing a bit about how and why you came into the world, because I've often had those thoughts myself about looking back at things that have happened, like just in my own family, and thinking, well, if that hadn't happened, if that tragedy had not happened, mm. then one set of grandparents would not have met, mm. I wouldn't be here. Yeah. And the same thing on the other side, if another tragedy hadn't happened, then my parents would not have yeah. met. And, and I think with Merton, you think, as you mentioned, about his mother dying when he was what, six. five, six, mm -hmm. something like that, and his father dying when he was 16, and then brother in the war. He ended up really an orphan. And, and all the other situations in his lives, and, and then thinking in the bigger picture of the world we live in now, mm. you know, with all its problems and tensions, and yet with also all the blessings, mm. but they all come in a package. And I think sometimes we want to try and rewrite history, whether it's global history or national history or personal history, in some, I think, misguided or illusory attempt to gain wholeness yep um, absolutely rather than being able to live with the ambiguity yep and the fragmentation thank so, you so thank you for highlighting that because for me that's at the heart of what i've been hearing tonight. thank you that's precisely what struck me and i hope to convey a little of um because I think the implications are huge if we can learn to live with those bits and pieces. The horror and the beauty will always be there together at the same time, always. This is human life. Get used to it. It's not going to change. The details will change. But what about the ambiguities in our own living or the stories which are imprisoning us of who we are? The stories we tell ourselves and how they imprison us. Um, are there other ways of telling the story? What we do to each other all the time because of the way we've already interpreted each other. I mean, th these are political implications we have Brexit because we didn't know how to live with the complexity of reality. And so much resentment built because people couldn't live with the ambiguities and fragments and complexities of life that they fell back on that stupid old story which was never true of plucky little Britain who didn't need anybody else. It was never true. Read my argument with the Gestapo. Merton tears it apart. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. If we can just live with the mess, you know, or we, we live with endless anxieties, don't we, about where we're all going to end up, and especially in relation to climate and ongoing tensions and battles over resources. and though, those are real things, those are real things. But we never see the full picture. And I think that's a hopeful thing. 
you have to learn to stand not seeing the whole picture. I mean, thank God for how lucky we are being in a place like this with enough food in our bellies and, you know, we reckon tomorrow's going to be pretty much like today. We, it's that stable. Thank God. We're also conscious of the billions of other lives who are living very differently. How do we live with the tension of that reality? And if we can learn to live creatively with it, then we have a future. If we can't, I think we don't. I think it comes down to that. For me, on behalf of Vancouver School of Theology, thank you so much for being with us. And I think you you just proved how I um, how we actually don't want wholeness because, ironically, we wouldn't need an annual Merton lecture if we already had a whole understanding of who Merton is and was. And so, just thank you for bringing us yet another fragment of who um, Thomas Merton was and a, a fragment of him through your eyes and your vision and your heart. So on behalf of us at Vancouver School of Theology, we, we thank you. On behalf of the Thomas Merton Society of Canada, it's a pleasure once again <laughs> to talk to you, uh, Gary, and, and the crowd here about um, how, wonder how wonderful it is for you to be here. And it's taken a while to get you here. We're delighted that you are here. I was uh, struck by several things. Um, I won't go into, into them all, of course. But, but the uh, fragmentariness, um, the struggle or aching into wholeness, what exactly we mean by wholeness, the importance of maintaining spiritual equilibrium, a very important thing for uh, Thomas Merton. And I'll push this out as an idea, but I believe it as, as, as seriously as I believe the creed. You can't understand Thomas Merton unless you know William Blake. Thomas Merton is the William Blake of our century. And then when you begin to understand it, you can see how he can balance the four Zoas. You can see how he works within the inherent contradictions that are the destabilizing but nonetheless necessary component of, uh, of human reality. So I was especially glad to hear you refer to the geography of Legraire. One hardly ever hears that alluded to. It is a work of uh, mystical opacity. Um, and the uh, other work, the mis uh, my argument with the Gestapo, uh, a failed novel but a brilliant portal into an anguished mind. So by bringing all these things together um, and uh, putting them as a kind of mosaic, um, um, you did something I think Merton was especially good at, Gary, and you've given evidence you're good at as well, and that is working outside of an as systematic unfolding of a particular thought as it, as it works its own way in the whirligig of Merton's imagination. So thank you. Thank you.